Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this talk. Uh, it's called Playing Tetris with Cognitive Load. My name is Manuel Paish. I'm one of the co-authors of the book Team Topologies with Matthew Skelton. And the book is called Team Topologies, Organizing Business and Technology Teams for Fast Flow. So um, it's focused on organization design, organization dynamics uh, for organizations that want to achieve fast delivery, fast uh, response to customers and to, to problems as well. So I want to talk to you today about Tetris. Um, I hope everyone uh, remembers the game. If not, that's going to make me feel uh, quite old. But um, it's a very simple game, right, where you have different pieces with different shapes um, and colors or sometimes um, without, without colors, but different shapes. And you can rotate the pieces, and you have to make them fit together um, as, as, as well as possible so that you complete the lines. And you know the lines that are completed disappear. Um, and so if you let the, the pieces start to pile up all the way up, and then uh, the game is over. So we don't, we don't want that. And of course, today I'm going to talk about Tetris, and I'm going to make an um, analogy to software delivery and software operations. Um, so let's assume that when we complete a line, that means we've completed some piece of um, software or product that we want to deliver to our customers, right? So that's our goal, to keep, keep going, um, be predictable, achieve a good speed of delivery and operations. So in that sense, let's we can look at the, you know, the canvas where the pieces are coming down as sort of the um, cognitive load for the team that's developing this product, this software. And we can look at the different pieces as different aspects, different knowledge, um, and different concepts and skills they need to have. So I use some examples for modern software delivery teams. You know, you expect them to understand about CI/CD, understand about infrastructure, automation. Um, security and many other aspects, right? So it's sort of this this puzzle where we're trying to fit the the, um, the pieces together. Um, so if you look at the broader picture of everything that we expect modern software delivery teams to know and and to um, be able to work with on a relatively um, frequent basis, then you might come up with something like what I have here in this slide, you know, you expect them, of course, to understand about coding, architecture, um, and then these other aspects I mentioned, security, CI, CD, infrastructure, test automation, operations, etc. So there are a number of competences that, that they need, right, for modern software delivery. But like John Cutler said, um, and he says this very frequently, he's a, a product management guru, I would say. Um, he talks a lot about product development and also team dynamics um, and organization dynamics. Um, and so he's saying this kind of fundamental idea that great products and great services emerge from empowered, fully cross-functional teams, right? So what are these kind of skills and competences that are needed for this full cross-functionality for product development? Some of them we just saw. But are these the only ones? Is this everything that's needed? Well, actually, if you look at it, that's all we need as a team to build the product right. That's starting from the assumption that we already know what we should be building, that we have the right uh, roadmap and we have the right features in the roadmap that our customers need. But actually, that conclusion requires a lot of other work to happen as well, right? A lot of discovery work to actually understand our customers, understand what they need, um, and of course, understand how the market is evolving as well, the market where we are um, an actor as an organization. And so to actually be able to validate that what we're building is the right thing, not just that we're building it the right way, um, and so that we're actively seeking feedback from customers also uh, looking at the, the, the metrics and information coming and the logs and everything that's coming out of our running system to understand you know, how our features being used, what are the sort of problems people are having, what's the performance, et cetera. Um, and understanding the market itself, understanding the business where we're operating so that we can provide a better service 
and then constantly adapt uh, to the changes that are happening. Um, to do that, to achieve all these things, we need to go back to the game, sort of, sort of saying, um, and add more pieces. There are more things that we need to know as a team um, around, you know, UX, user experience, business metrics, uh, design thinking, understanding product viability, market evolution, etc. If we're talking about a, a real cross-functional team that has the own end-to-end -end ownership of the product or the service that they're delivering. So there's a lot going on, right? So there's a lot of different pieces that we need to fit in. And, you know, I kind of see the, the holes in there in that image from the, the Tetris game as, um, you know, holes that we have in our knowledge. Also, the fact that we need to um, do a lot of context switching if, if there are all these pieces that we need to sort of um, master, if you like, as a team, then um, there's going to be a lot of context switching as well. So in this image, we can see it's um, a, a much wider range of skills that we actually need in order to be able to um, not just build the product right, but build the right product, actually discover what our customers need, what is going to make them um, satisfied and therefore provide more value to us, whether that's in revenue or some other um, value that uh, we'll get for the organization. So again, more pieces that we need in order to achieve this, this sort of um, cross-functional team. And this is something that uh, Peter Newmark was already saying and other people obviously have been saying um, for a while when we started talking more and more about cross-functional teams and of course also uh, with the evolution and in the introduction of DevOps in most organizations, the fact that we need less, we need to avoid silos where people are working on a, on a very narrow kind of domain of responsibility and we need product teams that are cross-functional. So. Um, since we started talking more about that, um, Peter, like people like Peter have said, you know, one of the problems with that approach is that these product teams are going to need a lot of competences. Um, and so if they don't have those competences, we they might have to take shortcuts or do things um, in a rushed way, which means the results will actually be um, much less um, fitting to the customer needs than we, than we expected and to the organization needs. Um, and Peter Newmark at, the, at this time was working at Prezi where they had a very interesting approach where they, they had really, they were promoting product teams to be as autonomous as possible, uh, almost like mini sort of startups. Um, and so even in, in their scenario where they were actively promoting this sort of um, team approach, it was still complicated, difficult sometimes. So, should we give up then? Should we just say, well, it's, it's, it would be great, but it's not possible. We just can't um, have all this cognitive load on the teams. Uh, we can't have all these competences at once. Um, well, I would say we don't have to give up. We can continue playing um, this, this game of you know, achieving faster flow of delivery and, and operations. Um, also, because I'm only halfway through this talk, so it would be weird to, to stop now, right? So it's not game over. Um, we need to be more intentional about how we think about cognitive load. First, um, first of all, uh, addressing it, understanding that it exists, that is a, is a problem for many teams. Um, and so we need to also have a, a good definition of cognitive load. I've, I've just talked about it in kind of um, a very high level, but there's actually a specific definition of what cognitive load is. This is at the individual level where uh, John Sweller, psychologist in the 80s, said the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory. So we can apply this idea to the team as well. So the total effort available um, in the team that is being used as being consumed to um, deliver the work. Of course, teams with different responsibilities, different missions will have different types of um, skills and, and, and competences that are you know, uh, needed for to, to minimize their cognitive load. But we're talking from a software delivery perspective. In that case, there are actually three different types of cognitive load. There's intrinsic cognitive load. So let's say this team is working on some Java system 
um, then they will definitely need to know things like how do I define a class in Java or how do I create a, a unit test and, and um, a lot of other things which are kind of intrinsic, the, the basic uh, skills that they need to do their work, right? Then there's extraneous cognitive load where this relates to all the tasks, all the activities we need to do to be able to deliver our work, but are not directly related to what we're trying to solve with, with what we're doing. Um, so again, for a software delivery team, this might be, uh, we have to remember how do we deploy the application or we have to remember how do we access some database or we have to remember um, how do I clean up test environment or how do I uh, run some performance tests, all these sort of activities that are gonna take up our effort, our cognitive capacity, which are not directly related to you know, solving the problem or delivering the value. And the third type of cognitive load, as you might expect, is then related to everything around sort of the, the problem domain, the, the things we're trying to address, the, the, the value we're providing to the business and to our customers. So assuming that team would be working, for example, on a um, banking system, then they probably would need to know things like how do bank transfers work um, and a lot of other kind of business related aspects of, of their system, right? So once we have this separation into th three different types of cognitive load, um, that's going to help us address and minimize the some of these types of cognitive load. So you can kind of generally think of intrinsic as the skills, extraneous as all the kind of the mechanisms that we need to deliver our work and get our, our the value to the customers and, and the organization, and germane as everything that's focused on solving the problems, the, the, the business domain um, related aspects. With this in mind, what we actually want for product teams, for those cross-functional product teams, is to minimize the intrinsic and extraneous cognitive load so that they can spend more time on, on the germane aspect, so they can spend more time and have more capacity available to understand the business requirements, understand the customer frustrations, understand the customer aspirations as well. What are the things that we should be helping um, our users with? So that requires time. We can't play the Tetris game where we fill up all the all the canvas just with the, the, the kind of the more um, technical and mechanical aspects. We need to have space for the business focus. And so how do we do this then? How do we kind of get started and address this the problem of cognitive load in teams? Um, the first thing is to make it explicit. We can start talking about it. Um, we want to understand what are the teams that are struggling a little bit, that have problems to understand, uh, fully understand the system or the product that they're responsible for. Um, let's try to kind of bring that up to the surface, understand where that um, problem is. Because what we what we really want at the end of the day, if for product teams that are um, really cross-functional, that they really have end-to-end -end ownership of their product or service, um, they need to have sufficient cognitive capacity to build, test, operate, release, understand um, the service that they're responsible for. And we can do this the simplest way and the, the way that I would recommend to start is ask the teams. They will know better than anyone else um, what they're struggling with, what are the things that are difficult for them, um, the things that they maybe try to avoid doing because they're painful. Um, those are the things that um, are kind of taking up space in their cognitive capacity that we'd like to, to free up if possible. Um, we also have a very simple example of a form to assess team cognitive load where effectively we're asking the teams about what is your, the experience, your engineering experience uh, in particular of you know, building, testing, deploying, uh, monitoring, uh, running your, your service. Um, you can look at that as a kind of starting point. We have a number of resources that are free on, on GitHub, uh, like this one. Um, each organization is gonna have their own context. So you're gonna have to ask the right questions to your teams depending on what sort of um, 
products and services you deliver, your industry, and the kind of maturity of your teams. But you can look at this as a starting point. So basically, bring to the front, um, you know, to to everyone's mind, what is team cognitive load? That is a, it's a real thing that is affecting possibly their capacity to deliver faster and to have better uh, quality and better operations. The second thing we should be looking at is have team size software. Um, so what do we mean by this? Have the teams responsible for um, pieces of system or for diff independent services as much as possible with the correct size, right? We can't just, and this typically happens with successful teams that have been able to deliver with good quality and um, quickly they get asked to do more and more and more. And we're, we lose track of the fact that they have limited cognitive load, right? We can't just add more things to um, the responsibilities of a team without that having a negative effect on their ability to deliver um, and run their services. So we need to size the software to fit the capacity of the teams. Effectively, we in many cases, we need to limit the size of the software um, that the team is responsible so that it fits their cognitive load um, and their cognitive capacity. When you do that, you'll start to see um, something which resembles more what's on the right side of this slide, where um, you have better alignment of different parts of a system um, and different parts and different services possibly to different teams. There's more clarity on which team is responsible for what. And also the size of those different services um, starts to become more uh, similar as well. If you look at the left side, that's what we often see in many organizations where there is no conscient um, effort to address cognitive load and limit the size of software. So you have teams with very large uh, responsibilities, teams with uh, much smaller ones, uh, you have parts of the system that maybe have no owners, they're kind of orphans. And so whenever there's a, a problem in that part of the system, it becomes a real a real um, challenge for the organization to, to deal with it. Um, and many times these are actually um, very, you know, sort of backbone of the systems of the organization. And, and um, unfortunately, they don't really have a concrete owner. So we need to address this, uh, the sizing of the software to fit the capacity of the teams. And finally, and of course, it's the main topic of, of the book we wrote is finding the adequate team topologies. So there isn't a right topology where we say for one organization, this is exactly the, the teams we should have um, to achieve our goals. Um, there's no single right topology, but there are many that might be ineffective. Certainly, if there is no uh, clear intent by the organization to think about uh, the types of teams and the interactions that should happen um, to achieve the certain goals, then um, very likely the the way our teams are set up and, and which teams exist is not uh, might not be adequate. So we need to start thinking about what are the capabilities are missing. Um, is this, are there some skills that teams need to have? Are there some services, kind of lower level services that would help uh, teams get up to speed? Um, so we need to think about what is the right topology or what is a more adequate topology, right? So there's no single right topology. Um, so for those of you who might be wondering, so topology um, is a, has a Greek origin and means the way different parts um, in a system, if you like, are interrelated or arranged. So when we're talking about teams, we're talking about what is the kind of the, the organizational landscape, which teams exist, how do they relate to each other? Uh, and what we see is often there isn't enough um, kind of thinking and explicit uh, intent to create a topology that is a good fit for our needs. So in the book, Team Topologies, we talk about four fundamental types of teams, if you like. Um, we start with the streamlined team. And um, the streamlined team is effectively has the same approach and the same purpose as the product team that we, I was talking about before. So it's a team with end to end ownership of a piece of uh, product or a service. 
So they're responsible not just to build and test and deploy, but also for the, the running of the service so that they can take that feedback and quickly make the necessary changes, address the, the, the user needs and, and frustrations as quickly as possible, right? So the reason why we talk about streams and not products is that kind of the product definition uh, becomes very often quite blurry. Also, we might have different, um, you know, large, we might have large products where you have different user personas. And so we might arrange teams uh, along those different streams according to different types of, of customers, or we might arrange in some particular cases around, you know, different cadence of change. And so stream is a more kind of uh, fitting term than, than product, um, we think. But effectively, the purpose and, and the way they, they should think about their work is similar to those cross-functional product teams. And so to achieve fast flow, we expect most teams in organization should be streamed aligned, right? Aligned to a value stream and with end-to-end -end ownership. So they can be as self-sufficient as possible in terms of identifying what do we need to do next and how do we do it and how do we get that delivered to our customers. So that's the starting point, the stream aligned teams. Ideally, we would only have stream aligned teams, but because of the problem with the competences and all the skills that are needed, um, that's where the other teams come in to address you know, the cognitive load problems. And so an enabling team is effectively a team of, uh, usually a small team of experts around a certain domain. This can be a more technical domain like uh, test automation or, um, monitoring and telemetry, or it can be something more around product development, can be around user experience. Um, it can be anything that we feel there is a need in the organization for uh, to address gaps in this domain. So what we do is have a small team of experts that are going to be helping other teams upskill and gain the knowledge that they're lacking. So enabling teams effectively reduce the learning curve, reduce the confusion as well um, for capabilities that teams need to acquire to uh, do their work. And they do this by teaching and mentoring. So we're talking about a um, sort of hands-on together with a team approach. It's not a, um, a sort of on a um, ivory tower just telling other teams what to do and providing guidelines. No, it's actually meeting the teams where they are, understanding for that specific team, what are the gaps? What are the things they need help with? And then doing that on a recurring basis um, as those teams progress and get more mature around that domain. Then we have platform teams as another type. So the platform teams provide services, usually kind of when we say lower level services, um, in terms of the, uh, when we look at the, at the stack of um, everything that's involved in delivering some valuable product to our customers. And so they provide those services to enable streamlined teams to be more autonomous, to deliver their own work with autonomy. Um, so it's quite important to understand what type of platform we're talking about, because these are not the traditional platforms where we have shared services and we, you know, we make other teams use it. Um, that can actually be counterproductive in many occasions. So we adopted this definition of platform, internal platform from Evan Butcher, and he talks about the digital platform as a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, but also knowledge and support arranged as a compelling internal product. So there are many key aspects here. Um, you know, he's, he's talking about uh, foundation of self-service skills. So because if, if this is not a self-service platform, if it's actually some people in a team that are waiting for requests from the streamlined teams to execute them, we're going to get into bottlenecks. We're going to get into delays and um, conflicts of priority uh, very quickly. So that's not a type of platform we're talking about. It has to be self-service um, that the streamlined teams can just consume when they need them. Um, and so those services, again, might be around monitoring, um, metrics, logging, um, infrastructure, provisioning, whatever that is, is uh, useful for the streamlined teams. There is support, meaning the platform is not just something we, you know, we build and we just say, here, here it is, just use it. We provide documentation, we provide support as a platform team. 
It has to be compelling. So that means we shouldn't enforce, not make, not mandate that the platform must be used by everyone, but actually allow kind of a more organic engagement with the platform. Let the teams understand that the platform is actually the best way, the, the way that reduces the effort for your streamlined team to do certain things. And it should be treated as a product, right? So in fact, the platform teams um, end up being streamlined teams themselves, where the product that they're delivering the services are the platform services, right? Um, so it's sort of a, a Russian doll thing. Um, but effectively, we need to think about the platform as a product. So we need to understand uh, you know, who are you, our users, the user personas, how do we get more engagement from our own streamlined teams, um, and you know, how do we improve the developer experience of consuming the platform, all these this good things. So it's not just any platform. It's a platform that makes it um, easier to use, easier to access those services that are um, required by our streamlined team so that they have less to worry about. Um, so that streamlined teams don't have to be setting up their own tooling for everything. Um, and you know, again, running around trying to keep up with all the, the, the skills and, and the capabilities we're asking for them. So we're, we're trying to understand, and that's also a role of the enabling teams to understand what are useful things to have in the platform uh, internally that will make life easier for the streamlined teams, reduce cognitive load. And finally, we have complicated subsystem teams. These are kind of an um, edge case. We would expect, in fact, most organizations should not need a complicated subsystem team, but to be complete and to make sure we address this um, uh, in some extent, there are complicated subsystems that uh, where we need a team to, to build and evolve a part of a system, which is not um, end user facing directly, right? It's not providing value by itself, but it's part of a, of a larger um, service or system, which requires specialized sort of PhD type of knowledge. So we're talking about, um, or at least used to be uh, face recognition systems, for example, um, video processing systems. These tend to have very complicated algorithms, um, and you often need people with very specialized knowledge. I would avoid, I would try to avoid doing this sort of teams, creating these teams based on technology, unless it's really, really niche and it's really, really hard to find those, those, those that knowledge anywhere. Um, because we want to avoid having sort of the traditional component teams that become a bottleneck again, where we have many teams that depend on a single team, which is then not able to respond uh, quickly enough. That also means a complicated subsystem team might exist, even though the kind of consumers of that complicated subsystem are just one other streamlined team. That's totally fine, because the goal is not to share, um, is not for a shared subsystem. It might be shared by multiple teams that use it, but the goal, the initial goal is to address cognitive load on the streamlined teams, because this is too complicated for them to um, take ownership plus everything else that's related to the end users and to the to the, other, the value that we're providing to them. So we talk about these four types of teams, and I'll come back to this drawing in a minute, but Understanding the, what types of teams we need, um, what capabilities we need to build in the organization is um, a starting point. It provides clarity uh, on what are the mission of different teams, how, you know, what should they be aiming um, to do and provide to, to the organization. But we also need to understand how do these different teams interact, right? What is the, the, the interaction modes, um, especially in the current times of remote work um, for most organizations, it becomes even more important because we don't have that face-to-face -face interaction to understand when should teams be talking to each other and why and what is the, the purpose. And so we talk about three core interaction modes in team topologies, collaboration, facilitating, and X as a service. So that um, we have not just a different types of teams, but we understand what are they trying to achieve when they are interacting. So very briefly, collaboration is not just um, in the sense that we usually talk about, you know, teams need to collaborate to be um, open to each other, but 
it's actually having two teams working together with a predefined purpose. And this purpose should be very clear so that we can understand almost as a sort of a, a test-driven approach where we can say, you know, have is the test passing or not? Have we met the goal for this interaction, for this collaboration? Because collaboration has a cost as well um, for those two teams. And so we want to engage in, in kind of purposeful collaboration where we say, this is what we're trying to achieve. Either we're, you know, creating, designing um, some sort of API so that we can clarify the, the boundaries between two, two parts of the system, or, you know, we're trying to understand um, how should the, the monitoring service in the platform, how should it work, what kind of uh, information we should be able to look at, et cetera, whatever it is, we have a specific purpose and we also have a pretty predefined kind of in, intentional um, duration for this collaboration. Do we expect this to take two weeks or two months uh, or is it one day per week for three months? What is it that we expect to happen? So that teams, again, especially in, in the remote setting, but in, in any kind of setting, teams have clarity on how much effort do we need for this collaboration? When should it happen? When will we know if the collaboration should be finished because we achieved the goal. The third type of interaction you see there is facilitating. And this is very typical for enabling teams where we're saying one team is helping another, but it can happen also between two stream aligned teams. If one team typically is more senior or has had more experience in some new area, um, you know, let's say, you know, we have a team that's more experienced with mobiles helping another team that never did the mobile, um, work to get up to speed. So we have one team helping another. Again, we should have a, a predefined purpose for this um, interaction and how long do we expect it to take. And finally, the one in the middle, acts as a service, is effectively the same as we hear about you know, infrastructure as a service, where we have providers like AWS, Google, um, et cetera, where we have one organization, in this case, inside um, the same organization, we have one team providing a service that other teams consume, right? So we don't actually expect that there is interaction, right? We don't expect when we're using AWS that we are gonna be on a call with um, AWS engineer, unless maybe you work at uh, Netflix and so you spend so much money on AWS that they will gladly um, set up a call with their engineers, but usually that's not what the expectation. The expectation is that the service is very easy to use, understand, and so we we um, just can use it by reading documentation, by looking at examples, um, tutorials, etc. So this is what we're trying to achieve internally as well, especially for our internal platform. So I'm I'm almost at the end of this talk. So. We really, when we're writing the book and we're looking at other organizations, what they're doing, um, you know, good and bad examples, um, we really think that these four fundamental topologies and the three core interaction um, modes are essentially everything that we need to build and run modern software systems. And perhaps even more importantly, to be able to continuously evolve the organization, evolve the dynamics, evolve the, the teams that we need and the knowledge that we need to keep up with the market, keep up with technology, um, while achieving fast flow of delivery, fast response to you know, cust changing customer needs, fast response to problems. Um, and so far we haven't been contradicted directly, um, but we do, we do believe this and um, we hope it's uh, useful for you as well. Um, so again, we need to tame cognitive load. We saw how it you know, causes problems in teams. If we're, we're letting kind of cognitive load go sort of unbounded, we're just adding more and more um, requirements in terms of um, competences and, and, and size of software that the teams need to be aware of. Um, and often coupled with not thinking explicitly um, about what kind of team structures, what are the supporting teams, and what are the kind of streamlined teams that we need to have in place. Of course, there's a lot more uh, we need to think about. How do we get to sort of independent uh, streams of work, independent value streams? Um, so we touch on that on, on the book as well, and other people have, have uh, written about that. But today we're focusing on, on cognitive load specifically. So, Unfortunately, you cannot pause the game of Tetris cognitive load, right? 
Um, it's, uh, it's always ongoing, but you can explicitly address it and try to minimize how many different pieces teams have to deal with um, by having you know, good uh, internal platforms with, with a, a very good developer experience that address cognitive load of, the, of your um, product teams. Um, and so we want to think about how do we reduce cognitive load for our product teams or our streamline teams and make it easier for them to sort of fit the different pieces into their, um, into their game so they, they achieve that fast flow of delivery and, and operations. Besides the book, Team Topologies, we're actually working on a, a workbook for specifically for remote teams. So it's with more kind of uh, practical insights that should be coming up um, soon on IT Revolution. Uh, it will be a free workbook. And we have a number of resources if you want to know more, both on our website uh, and also on github.com. So the cognitive load assessment uh, we've seen is one example. There are more. And if you want to keep up to date what's going on, we publish new industry examples um, as often as we can, as we, we find the time uh, to do that, um, so that we keep growing sort of the knowledge, understanding around team topologies, cognitive load, um, and many other aspects. Thank you very much. I hope it was useful. And um, maybe like me, now you feel like going and playing Tetris again, uh, if you haven't done that in, in several years, like, like myself. Um, so there's actually Tetris.com is where those um, images came from. You can actually play directly on, on the web browser. Um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Good morning, everybody. Once again, uh, from sunny Zagreb this morning. Uh, and hello to Manuel. Uh, we are live now. Hi, Ivan. So I'm in rainy Madrid after we had a, a snowstorm last uh, couple of weeks that uh, was never seen in 50 years. So uh, <laughs> not the typical weather say, in Spain. <laughs> I must say we heard about that one. And uh, yeah, it's not really, uh, it's not really pleasant weather at all. Thank you for the talk. And uh, I must say it was, for me at least, very refreshing to see this uh, Tetris uh, metaphor. And, uh, and also, since, since we got this shiny new big phones, uh, nobody ever plays Tetris anymore or, or Snake, for that matter. So <laughs> it was really Another interesting time. to see it again. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was great. And uh, this this topic of cognitive load is, is very interesting for me personally. I think that no matter how many times we talk about the cognitive load, it seems to me like it's, it's never enough. Uh, I feel like we don't pay uh, enough attention to it uh, and we uh, slip ourselves into all sorts of trouble. It's something like not, not paying attention to your blood pressure, something like that uh, for me. <laughs> And, uh, and it, seems, it seems to me like many times we act like a boiling frog. So not recognizing the situations when cognitive load becomes too high. Uh, I was wondering along those lines, uh, what are some typical clues that leaders and managers should look for in the organization to figure out that maybe they have problems with cognitive load? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right, I think. It's interesting, one of the, the ideas that many people told us they identified with from the book, Team Topologies, was the idea of cognitive load. We know that there is this obvious uh, limit, you know, a, a limit on the capacity of individuals and teams, just because, you know, our brain size effectively, um, on how much we can take in. So everyone understands that idea and, and everyone has felt in their um career that at some points, at least, they were uh, overloaded. And, and that had a negative effect on their productivity, on their ability to, to respond quickly um, to problems and, and, and finding solutions. So, but then, like you said, sometimes we, we know about it, but we're not always kind of um, intentionally trying to assess it, partially because there's no kind of strong science around it in terms of, of teams, if you like. So I mentioned in the talk, so um, John Sweller defined cognitive load for individuals. He has actually been doing some work around uh, group uh, cognitive load 
So that will be interesting uh, to see that research um, evolve. But effectively, in our organizations, we need to, to have a way to start looking you know, more uh, intentionally about um, on, on cognitive load. What are the teams that are struggling um, and why so that we can make sense of that to, to improve? Um, so I would say you know, some situations where you might feel um, obviously teams that are um, frustrated because they, you know, they have too much to do. Um, and they they don't find the time, or they want to you know they want to be better at things like uh, the quality of the software. They want to improve the security, but they feel like they don't have time. So some teams are and some people are more vocal, and they might uh, be talking about this um, actively. So that's a, a more clear sign. And then kind of the reverse from a kind of a people point of view, because at the end you always have to have the the, the people understanding. Um, to 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 get some of these insights, um, you can have the opposite where people feel like they've been uh, overloaded so much they don't they 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 stop proactively trying to improve things. So <laughs> I say this that effectively, if your teams are kind of silent and following the process without any complaints, that's that's quite a smell because that means uh, probably they're just you know grinding and trying to move along. Uh, but they're, we're not act actively trying to address the problem. They're just, you know, trying the, their best, but uh, we're not even talking about the possible cognitive load. So that's kind of on the people side and the team side, which, you know, that's what leaders should be um, worried about as well. What, you know, it's the, it's a hard hard part that we expect leaders to, to, to have, um, you know, uh, empathy and understand uh, what are problems teams are, are having. But there's also kind of the metric side, if you like. So one of the problems of too high cognitive load and, and um, you know having too much to worry about is actually directly related for people who are familiar with the Accelerate metric. So the Accelerate book um, that came out a few years ago, then these metrics have kind of been generally accepted. It's based on research um, to be you know good indicators of high performing teams. Um, and so how quickly can you deploy uh, changes and make changes to the software to respond to, to new needs or problems, uh, mean time to repair, recover from situations where our software is failing and change failure rate. So effectively, these metrics, um, the way I see it, are, are kind of indicators along, are we able to have you know, fast flow and, and high speed of delivery? Are we able to have good operability? So meaning, you know, our systems when they have problems we can recover quickly and are we able to have you know a good um, level of quality in the software so um, whether you use this specific metrics or, or something else that it's also in the indicative of those those areas um, if cognitive load is too high it will be difficult for teams to focus on quality it will be difficult for teams to um, go faster without causing problems. And so these metrics give us a good kind of balance. If we keep these metrics you know, at a, at a good um, level in terms of speed, quality, and operability, um, typically we're going to get higher performing teams. And if we have too much cognitive load, then those metrics typically are not um, at the right level or they're not improving. Yeah, the, these metrics are, are actually Pretty cool because uh, looking at them, they are actually focusing on the outputs. Uh, oh, sorry, on the outcomes and not on the outputs. And yeah. and basically, if we did something good to the structure of the teams, and if we figured out how the teams should be structured, and if we lowered the cognitive load, then these metrics should are bound to go up. And it's a nice way to to figure out if we if we tweaked something in the right way in the in the teams we should be looking at the the trends right so we don't it's not about kind of comparing or or saying you should be at this number but kind of looking at the trends are if as you're saying if we're making changes address, reducing cognitive load and um, improving the structures are we seeing an improvement in these metrics yeah yeah uh, folks, don't please don't forget about our poll. So we have a poll in the in the chat. Uh, we will also uh, aggregate and share this these data uh, later on. It will all be aggregated. So please feel free to to uh, take a cast a vote, and it will be very interesting to see the results. 
Uh, we have also a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, Andrea was mentioning that this, uh, all of this sounds good, but uh, it can be a bit challenging for the companies which are in between. Uh, I, I'm pretty certain that this in between means companies that start a day journey toward uh, agile transition, but are somehow stuck in the middle in, in some uh, temporary state. Uh, do you see such, such situations in the field? Um, yeah, I, I understand, and especially organizations that are going through agile transformation or DevOps transformation. Um, there's a lot going on, right? Um, I would try to to have this piece around cognitive load uh, also as part of this um, these changes. As we were talking about the accelerate metrics, those are actually quite good uh, for any kind of transformation uh, for us to see if you know it's not always easy to directly correlate the changes we're making to the metrics, but in general, we should see a trend again uh, that we're improving. Um, what I had one one client uh, last year, which they actually have quite interesting setup where they have um, agile coaches and they have a, the, the coaches themselves are a community and they're very, very a quite strong group. So they act inside the development teams, the delivery teams, but they also act as a group of um, agile coaches. And that's quite interesting because they're able to identify problems across different teams and see where, well, this team is doing, you know, certain um, part of the work, you know, very efficiently, another team not. Why is that? Maybe the other team has too much cognitive load. What kind of help do they need? So I actually saw that um, was kind of a, a surprise just because I hadn't thought about it before, but the, um, the agile coaches community can actually have um, a very good approach because there are there will be kind of cross team problems and bottlenecks where having uh, a group of people who are across all those teams will be able to identify that um, easier. So something like a community of practice, basically in the organization for sharing experience and knowledge. Yeah, it it's. Um, it might be even even in their case it was even more than that I would say it was um, the um, a community of agile coaches as kind of enablers of faster flow by mm -hmm. having this broader view and identifying the problems that are uh, cross team where we if we see multiple teams are struggling with um, I don't know infrastructure uh, you know we identify you know this is something we need to address maybe we need some better services in the platform or they need kind of help to uh, upskill their knowledge um, and things like that. So they're actually acting as uh, cross-team enablers. We we tend to use that that uh, phrase. You, yeah, at the end of the day, you need some entity in the organization. If you want to achieve faster flow, yes, each team is going to look into their own kind of work and in, reduce cognitive load, all these things, improve their, their skills but you also need uh, cross-team enablers. You need some entity, in their case was the Agile Coaches community, looking at you know, what are some of the challenges, some obstacles that we see more frequently, um, and, and what can we do about that? Great, thanks. Uh, we, we have another question from the audience uh, about uh, your time management and, or organizational tools to recognize and manage the cognitive load. Are there some tools in your tool belt that that you can use for for identifying uh, cognitive load time management or organizational tools that's a good question and it's actually something we're starting to see some um, companies trying to develop some tools around that um, it's still kind of early days and so um, we need it, first of all cognitive load is always going to be contextual right a different companies are doing different things, different businesses. And so we need to understand um, what is causing cognitive load within our, our context. Yes, there are common things around technology and, and delivery of um, digital products, but there's a lot which is which might be um, specific to the, to the organization. Um, what we have done that I mentioned, uh, we have a, um, a repository on GitHub for uh, which has an example of a form, simple form for teams to access their cognitive load. So we're basically, you should look at it as a conversation started, not a kind of, this is not gonna give us an exact 
number or, or exact uh, solutions. It's just trying to surface what are the problems that teams have, and then we can see across teams what are some common problems. If we see many teams are struggling with, I don't know, deployments, they're struggling with uh, responding to, to incidents, for example, then it looks like this is something we need to invest on. Um, so at the moment, there aren't, you know, um, mature or, or, you know, developed tools that we can say, yes, this is going to help you. But there are some companies looking at using information from, um, uh, from chat tools, obviously, information from, um, you know, booking meetings and, and trying to assess, you know, also aspects of are we having, you know, too much communication because perhaps we don't have independent uh enough independence in the teams to be able to do more, more work autonomously. Um, so these things are coming up, but it's still kind of early days. So in that repository, we will definitely add more um, useful tools as we, as we learn about them. Um, but you can start very easily first, you know, just get the conversation going. You can use that form as a, a starting point and adapt it to your specific um, questions for your teams that you think will be able to help surface pr the problems that they have around the technology, around uh, the business uh, knowledge as well. So y you can start there, but um, I'm afraid there's no kind of more uh, scientific or tool focused uh, approach at the moment. It's something that is really um, talking to the teams and, and starting to identify these um, sort of issues. Yeah, I, I feel you. I I remember once I read uh, about us should be very careful not to use these kind of tools as a shield uh, and an excuse for not talking to people. So these could also all be, as you said, conversation starters, but should probably never end up as a, as a tools per se that, that uh, generate some kind of diagnosis and, and next steps. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Manuel, thank you so much. We are running out of time. Uh, thank you for being with us on this keynote. We will see each other again later on in a panel session. Uh, now we will have a short break and we are continuing on the hour with the next, uh, with the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.